Hello and welcome. Today's program is North Korean sanctions and adaptation. My name is Tom Byrne. I'm the president and CEO of the Korea Society. International sanctions on North Korea are a multilateral, multinational effort designed to block revenue flows and convince North Korea to negotiate an abandonment of its nuclear weapons. In today's discussion, we evaluate the current state of the effort and ask what's to come in the road ahead. To inform this discourse, we are joined today by three experts who will explore counterproliferation finance, maritime evasion, humanitarian exemptions, multilateral coordination, and the role of sanctions in the negotiation process. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Bill Newcomb, Daria Doltsakova, and Cameron Trainer. The Korea Society team is grateful uh, to the Unique Korea Foundation with support made today's program possible. We thank you, our audience, for joining us, and we hope to hear from you. Please send your questions now and throughout the program to policy at koreasociety.org. And now I turn the screen over to our senior director, Stephen Norbert. Thank you, Tom. And thank you all for joining today. We've had 300 registrants. We thank all of you who join online for our YouTube broadcasts, as well as listen via our podcast uh, downloads. We would like to thank you for attending and encourage you to please become a member of the Korea Society if you're not already at koreasociety.org. Uh, we'd also like to invite you back for a December 3rd conversation with Scott Snyder of the Council on Foreign Relations on next steps on North Korea. And now to today's program where, through the kind support of Uni Korea, we marry established and emerging professionals. And we're looking forward to a very, very keen conversation led by my colleague, Jonathan Corrado. Jonathan? Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, thank you so much, Tom. And a warm welcome to everybody joining us today. With an upcoming transition in the White House, now is a good time to evaluate existing policies, including sanctions on North Korea, to ask what's working, what isn't, and what we should do next. In today's discussion, we're going to look at how sanctions actually function on the ground level. Focusing on maritime evasion and non-proliferation finance, we'll try to identify problem areas and talk about a few solutions. We'll also ask fundamental questions. Are sanctions depriving North Korea of illicit financial flows to finance their weapons program? Can sanctions succeed in inducing a change in Kim Jong-un's strategic calculus, creating an opening for denuclearization? I want to highlight a couple of recent articles uh, relevant to today's discussion. The first is a piece in 38 North by former National Intelligence Officer for North Korea, Marcus Garlauskas, who urges a more rigorous interagency framework to assess sanctions and inform policy. The next is a series of articles by Chad O'Carroll for NK News, featuring interviews with former members of the UN panel of experts set up to monitor sanctions enforcement. If you're interested in this topic, both of them are worth a read. Okay, it's time to now meet our speakers. We are delighted to be joined by three experts with the acumen to tackle these complex issues head on. Before I introduce them, we encourage you to send in your questions now and throughout the program to policy at koreasociety.org. We've already started to collect those, so thank you. We really love to hear from you, and uh, the engagement part of this programming is a really big part of it. So without further ado, let's meet our experts. William Newcomb is a fellow at the Center for Advanced Defense Studies and a member of the National Committee on North Korea. From 2011 to 2014, Bill served as an expert on the UN Security Council's North Korea Sanctions Panel. A former US government economist, Bill worked in the Treasury Department as Senior Economic Advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Intelligence and Analysis. And from 2003 to 2005, he was deputy coordinator of the State Department's North Korea Working Group. So welcome to you, Bill. Next up is Daria Doljakova, who is a research analyst in the Proliferation and Nuclear Policy Program at the Royal United Services Institute. Her research focuses on understanding and countering proliferation finance and sanctions evasion. Daria provides guidance to governments and financial institutions to help strengthen counterproliferation finance and sanctions compliance regimes. Welcome to you, Daria. And last but certainly not least is Cameron Trainer. Cameron is a research associate with the James Martin Center for National Nonproliferation Studies and a certified anti 
money laundering specialist. His work focuses on monitoring North Korean sanctions evasion, including tracking vessels linked to North Korea and using publicly available information to trace North Korean financial flows. Thank you for joining us, Cameron. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. And I'd like to start with just a getting to know you question. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background, your professional journey? How has your work on this topic evolved over time? Uh, Bill, can we please start with you? Well, thank you very much. And thank you to the Korea Society for this opportunity to participate in the conference. I'm a little hoarse today. So if you can't understand something I say, just ask me and I'll try to repeat it. Uh, I started looking in North Korea in the late 1970s when I was with the Central Intelligence Agency. I moved to the State Department working in uh, Bureau of Intelligence and Research in 1984. And I followed North Korea there uh, as part of a much bigger portfolio that included China. So my time was uh, obviously allocated according to the importance to policymakers of the issues at the time. Um, spent a lot of time on North Korea during the famine days of the 90s. But what really began the, the, my journey into the sanctions world uh, begins in the early 2000s when along with my uh, colleague, uh, David Asher, we developed what became known as the Illicit Activities Initiative. And that was designed to um, constrain North Korea's ability to raise funds to support these particular programs. If you recall, if anyone who's been following North Korea for a time, uh, Chosen Soren used to be a big supporter of North Korea. But as Japan entered economic troubles, the contributions from Chosen Soren into the DPRK coffers declined dramatically. North Korea made up this decline in money by stepping up its trade in methamphetamine to the extent that they were shipping meth by the shipload uh, to Japan. And so they were gaining money from this and from other illicit activities. And so we tried to put together both a domestic and an international program to constrain this. One of the results of this activity was um, in mid-decade, the uh, naming of Banco Delta Asia as a money laundering concern for North Korea. At that time, I had moved over to Treasury and I ran the investigation into BDA, uh, trying to pin down exactly what was going on. After we concluded that investigation, I retired in 2008. And then in 2011, I got a phone call asking if I would be interested in going to New York to join the panel. And to quote a, a famous movie, it was an offer I couldn't refuse. So that's how I got there. Thank you so much, Bill, and quite a distinguished career. Uh, can we turn to Daria now, Daria? Hi, um, thanks for having me. That's a really tough one to follow. <laughs> um, so I work as a research analyst uh, in proliferation nuclear policy at the Royal United Services Institute um, in London. A lot of my work focuses on counterproliferation financing, although not all of it, but that's sort of what I've spent the last um, two years that I've been at the Institute on is on CPF, uh, mostly looking at North Korea. So trying to understand North Korean uh, proliferation financing typologies, uh, what the patterns of their proliferation financing actually look like, um, and then trying to understand how do governments and financial institutions and other private sector actors um, understand their obligations when it comes to countering proliferation finance, as well as how do they understand, how do they look at proliferation finance, how do they understand it? Um, so that's sort of where I had um, started looking at PF uh, in sort of in detail. Um, prior to that, um, my interest in proliferation financing um, and kind of my, I guess my work or my, my research into it I actually started during my graduate education. Um, I had a professor who introduced me to the subject, uh, as niche as it can be sometimes. Uh, I'm very glad that he did, uh, so I'm very grateful to him for that. And that's kind of where the interest had started. Um, I had spent a couple of years um, working uh, in Canada, uh, which is where I'm from originally, um, with the Aerospace Industries Association um, in Ottawa. So working on the industry side of things. So kind of got the chance to understand how industry interacts with government um, and then moved over to Rusi where I've been working on CPF uh, since I joined. 
as I mentioned, mostly looking at uh, North Korea, North Korean proliferation financing patterns. Um, so that's included, um, like I said, kind of understanding typologies, but also trying to figure out tools that uh, we can provide and guidance that we can provide to governments and to financial institutions to better understand what PF looks like and how to counter it. Um, so part of that work has included articulating uh, a methodology for conducting risk assessments on proliferation financing. Um, and that's something that we're doing uh, increasingly more work on um, in light of a greater interest from countries in, assisting, in assessing their PF risk, um, but also in light of um, the changes that are going on at the FETF when it comes to PF risk assessment, which um, I'm sure we can dive into if there's interest in that. Um, I have also done a bit of work looking at uh, North Korean activities in Africa specifically and in Southern and Eastern Africa in particular. Um, there's a lot to look into there. Um, so that's been an interesting part of my work as well. Um, and then increasingly now, um, outside of sort of just the strictly North Korea proliferation financing work, doing a little bit more work on Iran proliferation financing um, as well. Um, and I think that's it. And I'm happy to dig into um, any one of those uh, over the next hour. Thank you so much, Doria. And Rusi is lucky to have you. Uh, we look forward to diving into some of those issues that you talked about uh, during our next uh, round of questions. And now let's turn over to Cameron. Cameron. Thanks so much for having me, Jonathan. Um, so I joined the Center for Non Proliferation Studies about three years ago. Um, my academic background, as much as there is one, is actually in Russian language. Um, so I was brought on to help with some investigations into. North Korea networks in Russia. And that's kind of how I got into the North Korea space. I've been fortunate enough to work with some of my colleagues on investigations into North Korean IT companies, um, North Korean construction workers abroad, and primarily in the focus of my com comments here today, uh, North Korea's shipping sector. Um, while at CNS, kind of, I was fortunate enough to be able to pursue certification as an anti-money laundering specialist, which is both informed how I conduct my work, but also kind of how we present our findings to others. Um, similar to what Daria mentioned, you know, engaging with both governments and the private sector can be a fruitful endeavor, um, but it is a complicated one. And especially with regards to the United Nations sanctions regime on North Korea, there's been such a rapid development of the scale of the sanctions regime and the scope of activity that falls under it. Um, so it's been, you know, a very eventful three years, and it's one that I hope to kind of share with you and with our, uh, I guess, listeners and viewers today. Thank you so much, Cameron. And uh, yeah, we really look forward to getting into that. We're going to start by diving into the deep end of the pool. Uh, Bill, if I could start with you um, on, on a very fundamental question. So if two of the critical goals of international sanctions are to reduce illicit financial flows, and change North Korea's strategic calculus. Can you please evaluate where we stand right now? Um, so what are the big challenges? Maybe you could touch on multilateral coordination, humanitarian, sanctions fatigue. And uh, going forward, how might the US and UN adapt and improve sanctions policy? Well, Jonathan, perhaps a, a couple of those issues we might pick up in the Q&A, like on the humanitarian. Um, what I'd like to do is answer your, your first question. And if we were to judge by the recent reports of the panel of experts and by the continuing arc of improvement that we see in DPRK ballistic missile and WND programs, well, sanctions aren't working very well. Uh, yet we know that they're not without effect because of the links to which the DPRK goes to uh, try to evade a number of them. Now, it's really crucial that we improve the effectiveness of sanctions on North Korea. And I think it's possible to do so. And I'll, I'll get to that uh, toward the end of my remarks. Now, the reason why it's a vital task, it extends beyond just the set of resolutions demanding the removal of the DPRK's threat to international peace and security. It's really quite bigger than that. If I could paraphrase uh, an old friend uh, that you all probably know, Rico Karish of uh, Compliance and Capacity. He told me, and I think he's written several places, that sanctions are the most powerful tool available to the international community to preserve international peace. Uh, 
If you think about it, that's why Article 41 in Chapter 7 precedes Article 42 in Chapter 7, which allows for the use of military force. So people um, condemn sanctions pretty often. I think the literature is, is filled with that. They don't recognize, I feel adequately anyway, the, the desirability of having this kind of tool to avoid the widespread bloodshed that warfare would bring about. Uh, now, one of the objectives that's repeated often in the resolutions is to have the DPRK return to the NPT. Uh, now, if sanctions fail, then we not only risk making it a useless tool to the Security Council to preserve peace, we also undercut the authority and the utility of the NPT because this could encourage other states to stage a nuclear breakout. And I think this is often overlooked as well. And that's why I think it is such a crucial, crucial task for the international community to take the ineffectiveness of sanctions in hand and look for cures. So uh, that's, that's, I think, um, a major point that um, is never in the dialogue. So um, it's, it's urgent. Um, now, if you want to measure uh, the problems uh, of compliance, a, a good place to look is with work of David Albright at ISIS. And they just published earlier this year, they took a, an assessment of the panel of experts uh, reports during the uh, last period. So they had the midterm of August 30, 2019, and the final report of March 2nd, 2020. And so they went in and they made a count. They found that the panel had uh, discovered 250 alleged violations involving 62 countries. 39 of the 62 were responsible for 20 or for two or more. 12 included, 12 countries included more than five. That's China, Hong Kong, Sierra Leone, Indonesia, Russia, Togo, Honduras, Vietnam, India, Italy, um, Panama, and Singapore. That's quite a diverse and it's quite a global selection. So it shows you just right there how North Korea operates looking for states that have weak compliance or lack of enthusiasm um, and are able, as I say, to launch global efforts at sanctions evasion. Now of those, uh, not unexpectedly, China was responsible for 60 of the alleged violations, Hong Kong for 20. And if you want another idea about how uh, states are implementing sanctions. Um, there's a, another effort that ISIS has conducted. It's called the Peddling Peril Index. And so it goes through and it looks at various countries' compliance with all the different resolutions and so forth and the state of their enforcement. So that's, that's no surprise, but at least it, it's a quantification of the kinds of problems that we're dealing with. Now, the challenges that we have, they're pretty well known. We're not having to discover anything new. I can run down a, a really quick list. Um, too many states have failed to implement the resolutions. That's easy to count. Just go on the 1718 website, you know, and, and you see uh, which uh, member states have implemented which resolutions. Uh, but you can't often tell how well they've implemented it because they don't provide the concrete details as they should. So you would have to go look up what they've done in that state. Often you find that the implementation is incomplete um, or uh, incorrect. Um, that causes problems. Singapore, for example, lost a Supreme Court case because they implemented incorrectly uh, the proliferation finance requirement. And so uh, the shipping companies that were involved in this, uh, their convictions were overturned. 
Presumably, Singapore has now corrected that deficiency. But Singapore is an advanced uh, administrative state, right? And so if they have problems, you can imagine the kinds of problems other states face. And so that brings us to one of the big problems, and that's lack of capacity, right? Small states don't have the funds for training. If they do train people, there's frequent turnover. It's really difficult for them to run proper export control procedures. Um, their, their banking compliance is generally slipshod in some of these states because the banks just can't afford the compliance programs. Uh, then there's a lack of political will. You find this often pops up in some of the African states where North Korea was a uh, early uh, supporter of some of the liberation movements and consequently got some goodwill. And so people who led those uh, revolts back then are now in positions of influence and they use that influence to support work with North Korea. Uh, they have something in common with a number of states that are sym sympathetic to North Korea. We have Iran, we have Syria, we have Venezuela, uh, we have Cuba, we have others that are supportive. And in the case of Iran, evidently supportive quite a bit financially. And then we have the problem of widespread corruption where DPRK agents of influence are able to go in and smooth the way for some of these evasions. Uh, now, there's also high levels of political calculus going on like in Beijing or Moscow, where they judge, well, how much support do we give to sanctions and how much allowance do we give for evasion, particularly trade along the border uh, in oil and coal, which I suspect will be analyzed in the maritime discussion. Uh, there are violations that occur in multiple jurisdictions. So that makes investigations very difficult. It makes prosecution very difficult because there's a lack of very smooth international cooperation in law enforcement. And not everybody has an MU, MOU in how to do this. Um, there's a problem with finance, which I'm sure Daria will get into uh, a bit, but banks just aren't doing a very, very good job uh, in terms of their due diligence. Under FATF rules, dealings with North Korea require enhanced due diligence uh, to protect uh, the banks. Uh, they require extra efforts in know your customer, which obviously aren't being done. I mean, look at the recent report by investigative journalists on uh, how uh, plutocrats have been able to do a lot of money laundering through major banks in the billions of dollars. So, I mean, North Korea transactions are a lot smaller than that. And they easily slip through uh, using a, a lot of fronts uh, and so forth and shell companies. Uh, and then finally, not often brought up, governments are resist resisting reform of rules that require identification of beneficial owners. So when North Korea goes to some of these secrecy jurisdictions or to states like Delaware, Wyoming, and so forth, they set up companies uh, that you really can't uh, track. And so while banks are supposed to know beneficial owners, they often don't do. And, and so that causes a problem. How much time have I got? You're good. I'm good still? Yeah, okay. yeah. All right. So now if you look into cases investigated by the panel of experts, you can gain insight into what worked for the DPRK and what doesn't work, which is what brought it to the panel's attention and why it became a case in the first place. So you see what of their methodologies failed. But when you're on the panel, you also learn there are cases that are never, never brought to the panel's attention officially. Right? Either the government's embarrassed or the government doesn't want to uh, surface the uh, failures of some of its procedures, or uh, the government has been leaned upon by some powerful third party uh, not to expose this particular transgression. Uh, so we knew all this took place, but our hands were tied in terms of being able to investigate it. And so if these are what's known, you know that the the unknowns out there are probably pretty darn numerous because we, again, we see the results of that in the weapons programs, right? We see the results of that in the shelves filled with luxury items. Uh, so we know that, you know, sanctions are being violated wholesale 
but investigations are only catching uh, pieces of that. So uh, let's look at real quickly at the trajectory of sanctions. We started off sanctions, again, very important tool. They were comprehensive and those caused lots of problems. At the turn of the century, the UN was involved in a, a lot of meetings looking at sanctions issues. I mean, uh, there was the Stockholm process, the Bonn Berlin process, the interlocking process. They were looking at things like due process for those who were designated, right? How to make sanctions more effective, less problematic. Uh, where unintended consequences, like what happened in Iraq, don't get repeated, right? And so that caused a switch to the targeted sanctions. And so sanctions against North Korea adopted first in uh, Resolution 1718 in 2006, followed this new model of targeted sanctions. And so did the sanctions subsequently adopted for Iran, right? But they were slow to take effect and they were more easily evaded. And so to try and get more traction, we have found more recent sanctions resolutions targeting uh, the big ticket uh, exports by North Korea, right? Uh, foodstuffs, seafood, textiles, coal, and some of their crucial imports like oil. So you see that there is a drift not totally back, but back in the direction toward comprehensive sanctions. And that can cause problems with unintended consequences, uh, as well as some of the very broad uh, financial restrictions, which makes banks very shy about dealing uh, with transfers of funds to North Korea itself, which causes problems, obviously, for the NGO community. So, I mean, those are some of the the trends that we see going on. Now, following all of that, there was another uh, look at sanctions. It was called the High Level Review. It took place in 2015. They came out with uh, 150 concrete uh, recommendations for changing uh, the application administration of sanctions. To my knowledge, none of those have been ado adopted. Uh, which indicates that the Security Council has no appetite for change. And since sanctions, the resolutions normally come about when there's been a provocation, uh, an extreme provocation like a nuclear test. If the North Koreans don't test in the near future, we're not likely to have more resolutions. We're not likely to have a chance that the Security Council uh, would take to uh, strengthen sanctions. So. What has to be done is to improve the enforcement of the sanctions on the books. Right? Um, Got to do just a better job. And that's where it becomes very important to recognize that member states, particularly key ones like the United States or like the EU uh, collection can do much more with secondary sanctions because secondary sanctions can give teeth to the UN sanctions to help make sure they're enforced. Where states that are uh, lax about rigorous enforcement can be uh, leveraged or encouraged uh, through the threat uh, that they would be uh, held to account to go ahead and uh, put a little muscle in their investigations and prosecution. So let me leave it there. Uh, I know that there'll be a lot of uh, questions to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill, for really a fantastic overview of, of where we sit right now and what some of the big challenges are. And uh, that also suggests some potential solutions that we might want to pursue in order to overcome those challenges. Uh, Daria, can we turn to you? Uh, I want to ask you, what is it like and why is it necessary to work with governments and financial institutions to build out counterproliferation finance regimes? What are some of the common weak points that you usually help to address? And have you noticed any change over time in implementation success? Thanks, Jonathan. Um, 
And that was a really kind of comprehensive overview from Bill on um, the state of sanctions on North Korea and the state of compliance as well. So um, I will just add on to that uh, because I think that does provide a really, um, Bill to provide a really, really good overview of where I think a lot of the challenges still lie when it comes to um, government's abilities to comply with uh, UN sanctions. But to give you a bit of an idea of the kind of work that we do, um, a lot of what we do um, when we reach out to and speak to um, governments, to financial institutions, um, is basically awareness raising. So helping them understand what does proliferation financing actually look like? Um, and then what are the obligations at the international level when it comes to countering proliferation finance, uh, sanctions evasion? Um, and then um, just as importantly, if not more so, what tools do they have at their disposal um, or what tools can they build to help them in um, sanctions compliance and countering proliferation financing efforts? Um, so a lot of kind of the challenges that we see are a lot of the ones that uh, Bill had already mentioned. Um, and I mean, it's, it's a little hard to generalize because each country is obviously very unique and each institution is very unique um, in terms of the proliferation financing risk that it's exposed to. Um, also the, again, the political will that exists um, in a country and an institution to address it, um, the weaknesses, the vulnerabilities that exist in a given jurisdiction as well as, again, the tools that are available to them. Um, so it's a little hard to generalize, which is why um, I find my job to be particularly interesting because, you know, every time you engage with a new jurisdiction, um, you're always learning something new because you're trying to understand, okay, what does their proliferation financing um, risk actually look like and their exposure look like? Um, it, it's also part of uh, why it's, it's challenging for me, but especially for, um, again, for governments and for institutions to address this because there's not a one size fits all. Um, you know, I think Bill had put it really well when he sort of presented the breakdown of where North Korea actually engages in sanctions evasion. And it really is a very broad scope of countries. Um, and I think, you know, the one thing that stays consistent is that North Korea will take any opportunity that is presented to it to generate funds, to move those funds, uh, to, you know, potentially procure proliferation sensitive activity to generate revenue. Um, and it will do that differently in every region, in every country, whatever opportunities exist. Um, you know, for folks who have read the panel of experts reports, um, they'll know just the wide range of activities. Um, you know, some of them fairly sometimes are kind of outlandish, some of the things that North Korea gets up to, to again, generate and move money. Um, so, again, that makes it quite difficult sometimes for countries to understand what their sanctions evasion or proliferation financing risk exposure actually looks like. Um, but a couple of, I guess, general recurring challenges that we do see, uh, both among governments and uh, within the private sector. And I should say, when I say private sector, I don't just mean financial institutions. Again, because the scope of sanctions on North Korea are so broad, and because the scope of the way that North Korea um, engages in sanctions evasion is so broad, um, we're not just talking about financial institutions. Uh, we're talking about commodities traders. Uh, we're talking about construction companies, potentially. Um, you know, it, it is quite a broad range of, um, of actors, accountants, lawyers, you know, your usual kind of group of uh, NFPPs, the so designated non-financial businesses and professions. Um, but some sort of common trends, I guess, and challenges that we see, um, there is often actually a misunderstanding of what proliferation financing actually looks like, whether in the North Korean case or more broadly. Um, a lot of times, you know, when we say proliferation, people think of a nuclear weapon and somebody buying that and paying for it. And that's what it is, right? So, um, you know, a lot of times people think, well, we don't they will, we don't, you know, we don't finance trade in nuclear weapons. We, you know, if we saw a nuclear You're not going to see a nuclear weapon um, on a bill of lading. Is my connection breaking up? You're back now. You were off for ah. just a, a couple seconds, but we got you back now. Oh, lovely. Perfect. <laughs> An understanding, or sorry, a misunderstanding of what proliferation financing looks like. So it's not you're not going to see a nuclear weapon on a bill of lading. Uh, it's a lot more complicated than that. So a lot of the work that we do is that kind of awareness raising of what PF actually encompasses um, and encouraging 
both governments and financial institutions to look broader than just proliferation sensitive goods. So again, in the case of North Korea, uh, you know, revenue generating activity through the construction of statues, for example, uh, you know, which we see in quite a few African states, um, or the deployment of workers abroad, uh, or trade in things like coal, um, which I'm sure, again, uh, Cameron will cover. Um, because revenue that's generated from that could potentially uh, feed into North Korean uh, missile and nuclear um, production and development, um, we can consider that proliferation financing. So you have to take a broader, more holistic approach to PF. Um, you know, a lot of times countries were also, or financial institutions, private sector entities, uh, will look out for trade in or transactions with just North Korea or Iran. Um, and as Bill mentioned, I mean, it's, again, it's not as straightforward as that, right? They'll go through shell companies and these corporate networks. So um, that's, you know, so that's, that's part of the work that we do is kind of helping um, governments, financial institutions um, identify some of these red flags that, you know, you might not have North Korea on a transaction, uh, but there might be some patterns that look like North Korean proliferation financing behaviors. Um, and then the other thing that uh, we see sometimes is um, a bit of a conflation between proliferation financing and other forms of financial crime when it comes to regulation and like due diligence processes in financial institutions. So, um, you know, governments sometimes will say, well, we have a terrorist financing. Uh, we have regulation for terrorist fi to counter terrorist financing or to counter money laundering um, or financial institutions will say, you know, our due diligence practices for terrorist financing or money laundering, that covers it, or even just sanction screening, you know, we screen against a list of sanctions. And again, it's just so much broader than that. Um, you know, and as Bill mentioned, there have been cases where because proliferation financing regulation, specific to proliferation financing wasn't in place, it creates challenges when it comes to prosecuting these cases that are actually related to PF. So just making sure that there are specific proliferation financing targeted uh, measures that are in place, both with governments and with financial institutions. Um, a couple of other things. Um, sometimes there are issues in kind of understanding or finding sources of information on proliferation financing patterns. Um, so, you know, not every jurisdiction is going to have a history of engagement with North Korea or proliferation financing cases. That's a good thing. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, countries might say, well, we've not had cases of PF in our jurisdiction. We don't actually know what we're looking for. Uh, where do we find this information? Um, you know, so we always point them to the panel of experts as, you know, the kind of the probably the greatest resource when it comes to, again, uh, instances of North Korean sanctions evasion. Um, you would be surprised, unfortunately, how many financial institutions um, and people that we talk to um, have not opened up a panel of experts report on North Korea. Um, and so, you know, it's just providing them kind of with information. On sources, um, again, it comes down to capacity a lot of times and resources. Um, a lot of governments, they just don't have the same capacity that, you know, a, a larger government uh, might have when it comes to their financial intelligence unit and the amount of effort um, that they can put into proliferation financing specifically. It's the same thing with financial institutions as well. Compliance departments and the size of those departments vary, vary, vary a lot uh, broadly. Um, and yeah, a couple of other challenges, I guess, um, just sort of off the back of uh, what Bill was saying. So um, the issue with corruption, um, I think that's an important one to note, both because it facilitates PF, um, but I think it also points to the point of um, a lot of these governments, again, because of limited capacity, they are dealing with a million and one things. Um, so a lot of times, you know, when you talk to them about proliferation financing, somewhat understandably, they say, why should I care about this when I have, like I said, a million and one other things, including corruption, including terrorist financing, including money laundering issues. Why is this something that I should care about? Um, so that's something that, um, you know, I think, I think is important to address. And I think is sometimes overlooked is the impact uh, or the correlation between proliferation financing and other forms of financial crime. A lot of the measures that you take to counter proliferation financing and to implement sanctions effectively will actually help you 
when it comes to countering these other forms of financial crime. Um, so things like, again, as Bill mentioned, ultimate beneficial ownership information. That is absolutely critical to countering proliferation financing and North Korean sanctions evasion to understand these shell company networks. But if you have clear um, ultimate beneficial ownership information available to financial institutions, that will also help when it comes to money laundering, terrorist financing, other forms of financial crime. So there is, um, there is a fair bit of, of crossover there. Um, and I think just highlighting the impact of PF um, on economies, um, you know, and, and in the intersection with, with other concerns and with other issues that countries might be dealing with, I think is, is really critical, again, just to communicate why it's important to focus on what might otherwise seem like somewhat of, you know, a niche subject, again, for countries who are um, just in over their heads when it comes to things that they have to, that they have to kind of address and, and deal with. Um, also, sort of on your last point in terms of uh, where we are and have we seen progress. Um, so anecdotally speaking, um, I am going to be um, reticently uh, positive, I think, um, in terms of um, not reticently, just I guess hesitantly, because um, this is just anecdotally speaking. But I do, I do see a bit of a trend in the recognition um, among governments um, on the importance of uh, addressing sanctions evasion by North Korea and others um, and on proliferation financing. Um, and I think, you know, part of that is probably driven by uh, developments at the FATF. Um, so things like, you know, the importance of assessing um, proliferation financing, risk exposure. So we see more and more countries, um, you know, engaging in proliferation financing risk assessments and undertaking those. Again, part of that might be because the FATF has now amended one of its recommendations to say that you should assess your exposure to PF targeted financial sanctions. Um, so, so there is that. Um, there is also, you know, Bill mentioned um, political will and the lack of political will. I do think that's still the case. As, as I said earlier, you know, there's a lot of competing priorities, but at the same time, um, it really has been heartening to see a lot of countries um, who have had a history of, you know, North Korean activity or sanctions evasion in their countries really take on board, um, you know, efforts to counter proliferation financing and come up with really, really innovative and creative ways of, again, understanding their risk exposure and, and countering it. Um, you know, I think part of that is also potentially driven by the work um, that's being done by non-governmental organizations, so like think tanks, so at RUSI, C4ADS, CNS. Um, I think you know the 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 research that's going into what North Korean sanctions evasion and proliferation financing more broadly looks like, and exposing a lot of these networks and patterns, I think is really. Um, it is helpful to helping countries understand what that actually, uh, what PF actually looks like um, and why kind of why it's a threat and why it's important to counter it. I'll stop talking there um, because I am very much looking forward to hearing from Cameron, um, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Daria. And a lot of really great points there. I'm sure they'll lead to lots of questions and further thought. Um, so now we're going to transition to Cameron. Uh, Cameron, thanks for joining us. Uh, the recent UN panel of experts report shows continued examples of maritime evasion to import oil and export illicit goods for sale. Can you take us through some of the trends um, and what patterns you've been able to identify in your own research? Sure thing, Jonathan. Um, so first off, as both Daria and Bill mentioned, the UN sanctions regime really does cover a whole lot of products, uh, including oil and uh, coal, as you just mentioned, but also as Bill mentioned earlier, things like seafood and textiles. Um, and these cargoes all need to be moved in some fashion. So North Korea's maritime um, assets, its merchant fleet plays an a very important role in raising revenue for the regime. My research at CNS focuses pretty broadly on those networks. We monitor the activities of vessels flagged by North Korea, as well as those vessels, whether or not actually controlled by North Korea, that are known or suspected to assist the country in circumventing the UN sanctions regime. At present, North Korea has over 200 vessels uh, that are registered to use its flag. CNS, as well as other organizations, including C4 ADS and RUSI, uh, use transmissions by these vessels, automatic identification systems, their AIS transponders, uh, to track them. As the name implies, these AIS transponders serve to identify vessels on the basis of, among other things, 
their name, their nationality, and position. Uh, if I could ask you to pull up that first visualization. Um, on screen, everybody is going to see um, what, there we are, um, AIS transmissions linked to North Korean vessels so far in 2020. From this, we can see that North Korean vessels are active predominantly in the direct vicinity of the country, but also that they make port calls in both China and Russia. While the UN sanctions regime doesn't actively prohibit uh, port calls in these countries, it does restrict the types of cargoes that they're able to limitly um, take on and offload at these ports. However, given restrictions on some of the availability of trade data, it'd be really hard to verify uh, or confirm whether or not these port calls are indicative of illicit activity or not. For more explicitly illicit trade, we can take a look at the next slide, um, which shows the activity of North Korean tankers. Here you can see that these North Korea's tanker fleet doesn't actually really enter foreign ports. And this is noteworthy because the UN sanctions regime prohibits the transfer of ship ship transfers of all commodities, whether or not um, they're otherwise banned by the UN sanctions regime. So while North Korea isn't actually capped in its ability to import, sorry, it is capped, it's not prohibited outright for North Korea to import petroleum products, uh, but it must do so through basically activities that we can monitor. Um, and ship, ship transfers are not one of those permitted avenues for the import of petroleum. Seeing that North Korean tankers don't enter foreign ports, therefore leads us to the conclusion that these, act that these tankers are engaged in um, illicit activity and we can permitted so sorry to take a step back for a second um permitted that we can identify all parties to the transfer we know that something that they are prohibited by the sanctions regime if we can move on to the next slide um i want to caution against using ais data for drawing overly broad characterizations of north korean maritime activity this chart briefly shows how many unique North Korean vessels are transmitting on any given day in 2020. Uh, you can see that it kind of has lows and highs there, but to put the highs in context, the highest point on that chart is 23 vessels transmitting concurrently. As I noted earlier, North Korea has 200 vessels in its merchant fleet. And those are the ones that are just declared to be flagged by the country. And so that leaves a great proportion of North Korea's fleet unaccounted for at any given time. From sort of recent-ish um, enforcement actions, we know that North Korea's fleet travels further than what was shown on the first chart. Um, and we can look specifically at the case of the bulk carrier Wise Honest, which was detained in Indonesia in 2018 with a quite sizable amount of North Korean coal that had it brought for uh, an illicit ship-to-ship -ship transfer and reshipment through to an actual South Korean uh, buyer. That's all of the visuals for right now. We're going to come back to them in a second. I want to devote kind of the remainder of my time responding to this question, talking about the tactics North Korea uses to evade monitoring. Uh, my own personal take is that they more often pursue a strategy of good enough standard of cover. Um, so there are great examples to point to of the elaborate ways North Korea seeks to disguise the identity of, it, of its vessels but quite frequently that's just not needed. The easiest example to point to is the noted absence of, a of AIS transmissions by, by most North Korean vessels. But in addition to disabling their AIS transponders, North Korean vessels can simply lie on them. They uh, can and do input false names, call signs, and identification numbers into their AIS transponders. The objective here isn't to really sell a convincing lie, but rather to get away with their illicit activity in the moment. They also frequently change which false identifiers they use, which helps them by separating different aspects of the vessel's activity across what appear to be different unique identities. A colleague and I highlighted a great case of this in an article for the Center for Maritime Security. We focused on the activity of Kumrung 5, a North Korea flagged cargo ship, and its use of approximately 30 different identifiers over just a seven month period. And we have a graphic of that to show you as well. So uh, the network chart on screen there shows the results of 
seemingly unique AIS records that we compiled using a network analysis platform. You can see that various vessel identifiers are quite separated from others. And had we not fed them through this platform, they would have appeared to be distinct, unique vessels. The map on screen shows how over the course of a couple of voyages, the vessel cycled through five different names, using them at different points in its voyage, at different points in its voyage to separate the port calls in North Korea from its activity in Chinese waters. Though we don't know what the cargo of the Kumbrung 5 was, the vessel frequented waters off Shanghai. The US government notes it's been used by North Korea for prohibited ship to ship transfers. There, we are under the impression that it may have conducted a ship to ship transfer or have received bunkering services. That's the transfer of fuel to the vessel for its own use. And bunkering services are also prohibited from being provided to North Korean vessels under the UN sanctions regime. In either case, it's the um, use of a false identity, including the unauthorized use of another country's flag that allows a North Korea vessel's uh, interlocutor to claim plausibly or not is up to you that the vessel, that they were unaware that the vessel they were engaged in ship -ship transfer with was North Korean. These foreign facilitators, while they're not operating on behalf or in coordination with North Korea, have their own networks and deceptive practices that largely mirror North Korea's. I'm not gonna say too much with respect to them right now, both out of respect for the time of the rest of our panelists and just so we can get to a Q&A in a moment, but I do wanna highlight a kind of rough estimate of the, the scale of foreign flag vessels um, engaged with North Korea. Based on our analysis of UN panel reports, corporate networks, and kind of observed maritime activity. There's likely at least 150 vessels with some foreign flagged vessels with some exposure to North Korean illicit activity. Some of these foreign flagged vessels are linked to North Korea. Some are just operated by folks who are willing to work directly with North Korea. But in many cases, they're linked by the same couple of different companies that provide services to a number of vessels. Countries should be using affiliation with those companies as an indicator of risk when deciding whether or not to permit a vessel to use their flag. And national authorities and jurisdictions where those companies are registered should be taking a close look at them as well. Unfortunately, there doesn't appear to be a concentrated effort on the focus on those companies, though I'm certainly curious to hear what Daria and Bill have to say about that as well. Thank you so much, Cameron. Uh, super interesting, a, a lot of food for thought. Um, I, I want to just do one last question before we proceed to the Q&A. So one last reminder for our viewers to please send in your questions if you have them to policy at koreasociety.org. I already have a bunch of those, so looking forward to tucking in there. Uh, so the last question is sort of uh, next steps going forward. Um, any final words on what kind of improvements you'd really like to see? Um, and, and then separately from that, what do people people typically miss when they have these types of conversations? Are there any big inflection points or indicators that maybe we should be paying attention to, but are not? Any thoughts from the panel on that question? Well, you want me to start? Yes, please. Thanks, Bill. <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll just make one, one point. Uh, and you actually uh, highlighted in your introduction a reference to the recent NK News interviews with former members of the panel of experts. And so uh, it's often not recognized that the politics that complicate actions at the Security Council level and uh, are then again replicated in the 1718 committee also exist within the panel of experts itself. So there is this this kind of tension. But there is a, a big difference. Uh, 1718 committee has not made any designations or acted upon any recommendations in quite some time. 1718 committee, its rules require consensus. On the panel of experts, the reason that it's able to put so much detail uh, about what happens in China and Russia into its reports is that the panel is required to seek consensus, not achieve it. So sometimes you will see um, uh, reservations taken out on certain points 
uh, by Russia and or China. Um, and in past, we had instances where uh, members of the panel, although they participated in the drafting of the report, refused to sign off on the final copy. That happened back in 2011. So games were being played uh, with the panel and its report. And the panel obviously has to take, uh, or members of the panel have to behave strategically so that there's not, there's not a repetition of this year in and year out. Um, and finally, the uh, lack of movement in the 1718 committee could be overcome by action at the level of the Security Council. There's nothing that prevents the Security Council from making designations. There's nothing that prevents the Security Council from telling the 1718 committee uh, to move on recommendations. Um, but it has chosen not to. And so I'll leave it at that, right? We have a major, major problem in Washington, in New York, uh, in, in the capitals of Europe, of conflicting priorities, right? And until conflicting priorities are resolved in one way or another, uh, I don't think we're gonna have too much success gaining traction on improvement of sanctions. All right, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, Daria, anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, um... I can give you a laundry list of things that could be done to improve things or that are often missed. Um, but I guess, you know, the thing that I always, always say, and I probably sound like a broken record to anyone who's um, who I've talked to before on PF, um, but I think it is so critical to conduct PF risk assessments. Um, I think it is so important both for institutions and for governments to actually put in the time and effort in understanding their exposure to proliferation financing and North Korean sanctions evasion. Um, again, just because otherwise, you know, if you're just screening against lists of names, um, again, as, as Cameron had mentioned, you know, a vessel that's sanctioned might change its name. Um, it's, you're missing so much if you're just screening against lists and so many um, institutions, governments still rely on on um, on list screening a lot of the time, um, and it's just not sufficient. So, you know, taking the time to understand the full scope of the international obligations, but then also taking the time to really assess your individual exposure to those risks, because how North Korea is going to engage in sanctions evasion in one jurisdiction is going to be very different or might be very different. Uh, from how it does that in a different jurisdiction. So, you know, in an ideal world um, for a counterproliferation financing expert, you know, all the resources that are necessary would go to CPF efforts, but that's just not the case. So to be able to prioritize efforts and understand really where effort and time and resources need to go in um, encountering North Korean sanctions evasion, um, assessing your risk exposure, I think is so, so, so critical. And again, I think more countries are, are starting to understand that. Um, so there's, they're starting to build up a good collection of best practices on how to actually do that. All right. Thank you, Daria. Cameron, how about you? Sure. Um, so just on the maritime front, I guess I specifically would like to see more public facing information, uh, specifically related to the deregistration of North Korea linked vessels by shipping registries. The registrar, the registry information sharing compact, an initiative through which registries can share with each other information on vessels they've deregistered, denied registration to, or suspect of sanctions violations is a great step. However, uh, as someone who works almost entirely based off of publicly available data, I selfishly would love to see more of that, especially as it makes it easier for outside analysts to um, to hold registries accountable for the vessels that they choose to register and to make clearer assessments on whether or not something is in line with the UN sanctions regime on North Korea. The sanctions regime explicitly prohibits the re-registration of vessels that were deregistered for ties to North Korea. So making those deregistrations public and uh, kind of promoting that action, I think would be both a good way for shipping registries to put down a marker for the action they've taken and make it easier to hold to account other ship registries should they seek to re-register those vessels. Thank you very much, Cameron. And uh, we're just gonna do two questions from our audience for the sake of time, and I'll throw them both out there now. Uh, and please let me know what you would like to say to these. So the first comes from 
the fantastic Roberta Cohen from the National Coalition of Independent Scholars. And Roberta asks if we could please comment on the kinds of luxury items prohibited by the sanctions, the intended recipients of them, and the extent to which sanctions actually inhibit their import. So that's the first question on luxury items. And the second question is from Ed Baker at Harvard Yenching Institute, and he wants to ask about Banco Delta Asia. Uh, do you regard this as a success or a failure? Um, so I'm sure, Bill, you'll have thoughts on that one. So in, in no particular order, if you have things to say on either luxury items or Banco Delta, uh, the floor is now yours. Um, I can jump in on luxury goods because um, I think it's a really, really interesting question and I'm so glad um, that Roberta asked it. Um, it's a really tricky one. So the types of luxury items that are prohibited by sanctions, um, there is a list of items um, that is you know, suggested by the committee as here's a list of luxury items or items that are considered to be luxury items when it comes to sanctions. But it's actually sort of it's left a little bit open. So these items are anything that the state considers, you know, could be a luxury item. So, you know, different types of alcohol is considered a luxury item, watches, cars, you name it. Um, so it's actually quite, um, it's a little bit tricky to define what actually counts as a luxury item. Um, and that's something that, so at RUSI, we're doing a little bit of work on trying to look at, okay, how do countries actually interpret what is meant by luxury, by luxury goods? Because it does, it does vary, um, you know, who the recipients of these items are um, and the extent to which sanctions actually inhibit their import. Again, the fact that um, there's not really sort of a consolidated specific list of these things are luxury items and here are the harmonized um, you know, trade codes for those items that you can, can screen against. Um, that is a challenge, right, for, for countries who are looking to, to, to screen against a list. Again, I'm saying it's not the best way to do it, but you do have to start somewhere and screening against a list um, is a good place to start. Um, but I guess that's tricky. And, uh, you know, reporting from countries uh, tends to be low when it comes to luxury goods as well uh, and reporting on sanctions evasion related to luxury goods. Um, so there's kind of a little bit of a dearth of data, um, I'd say, from what I've seen um, on, on luxury goods. Um, like I said, we have some members of our team at RUSI who are doing a bit more work on this. Um, so hoping to you know, provide a little bit more insight into on that question um, soon. I know C4DS, if I'm not mistaken, had done a bit of work um, as well on luxury goods. Um, so there is work being done, uh, but it's really an excellent question because I think it just hits the nail on the head on, again, some of the challenges that we're facing. Thanks so much, Daria. Uh, any other thoughts there, Cameron, Bill? Yeah, uh, if I could piggyback real quick on Daria's answer. I think one of the added ambiguities with the different definitions of luxury goods has to do with how those goods are shipped. Um, and there was a case a little while back, I think, of Russian origin alcohol being shipped to North Korea, but it was transshipped through I, another, a third country, uh, or I believe it was interdicted. And so the differing interpretations of the sanctions regime do create kind of, I'll be a little bit cagey on whether you want to consider them an opportunity or a headache, um, but there's ambiguity there that can serve a variety of different purposes and is kind of an added wrinkle when you consider the extraterritoriality of say US sanctions and whether or not any of those trans transactions kind of touch the US financial system uh, versus whether they fall afoul of local law. Thank you, Cameron. And Bill, uh, the last word goes to you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I can't swear that this is true. I've never had an opportunity to ask him. But I'm told that John Bolton, when he proposed luxury goods be added to the resolution, uh, was surprised when that was accepted, uh, that it was just an afterthought that was tossed in. So if I ever get the chance, I will ask him. Uh, it seems to me that that's probably true because you don't see that appearing as an item in other resolutions, right? Uh, but it definitely is a thoughtful attack on um, the pillars of support of the regime. Um, now, ambiguity is a friend of the Security Council. They often uh, seize ambiguity to get around uh, points of contention. So when the resolution was worded, they left it to member states to define what a luxury good was. And so when the resolution was published, uh, 
member states really didn't know how to uh, interpret their requirement. And um, the Swiss got in touch with the West Europeans and they were trying to work out together, um, you know, what kind of uh, definition they would use and what products, but you had some uh, differences in interpretation. Um, under the EU, they decided that a watch that was uh, the equivalent of $1,000 or more was a luxury good. To the Swiss, that's, that's still just a watch. For them, it was like $5,000 made a luxury good. So you have this conflict of interest. For the panel, luxury goods were a headache. You really didn't want to investigate um, where the wife got a, a, a very expensive purse or where a watch showed up from because it could be picked up at a jewelry store in Hong Kong and brought on someone's wrist, right? You were concerned by um, automobiles and other uh, goods of that sort, right? Um, it generated a number of cases. The disadvantage is it took time from investigations of other things. The advantage is that North Korea began relying on its overseas network to get the luxury goods as well as uh, dual purpose and proliferation related goods. They just didn't have the footprint globally or the financial arrangements globally to set up a luxury goods network and a contraband network. So having the luxury goods uh, prohibited, even though it's complicated, gave an opportunity to expose networks to scrutiny. So that was the whole advantage of it. And yes, C4ADS has done a lot of work on luxury goods and they, they published a report, uh, Lux and something or other, uh, just about a, a year ago, I think. So uh, if there's anything else on luxury goods, uh, I'll answer it, but the BDA, I'm not sure exactly what he wanted to know. Could you, is there a specific question? Yeah, so just uh, just for the sake of time, I guess a, a real short and, and sweet one. Do you regard it as a success or a failure? I, I guess uh, what Ed Baker was looking for is um, in terms of how it later was um, a complicated aspect of negotiations. Um, and, and this speaks to the nature of the relationship between sanctions and negotiations. To, to what extent are they an impediment and to what extent are they a helpful source of leverage? Well, I mean, I'm biased. I look at it as, as a success. Uh, the problem with BDA was it was poorly understood, uh, even though it was explained many times by uh, folks within state and at Treasury as to what it was doing. Uh, it was very poorly understood. And it was not about taking $25 million away from the North Koreans at BDA. It was about, uh, as a friend of mine said, putting your foot on their uh, throat uh, and starting to block the financial channels that they were utilizing because banks became aware of how North Korea was behaving in the international financial environment. Just to very quickly, within BDA, they had a major firm. Among all the other North Korean firms dealing with it, they had a major firm called International Finance uh, and Trade, right? I, um, IFTJ. It was a bank within a bank. So it would take money in from North Korean firms and dish money, dish money out to uh, North Korean uh, suppliers overseas and break the... Uh, ability of investigators to follow the money. And so it was a money laundering operation that was permitted by the people that were running BDA. And this is a, a signature aspect of how North Korea does money laundering even today, except it's not concentrated within one bank, it's now dispersed. They were doing that in Singapore. Some of the shipping companies actually we're dealing with banks and we're banks within banks. So yeah, I, I look at uh, BDA as a, as a significant success. Thank you, Bill. And thank you to all of our speakers today, Cameron, Daria, Bill, you, 
did a wonderful job. Uh, to all of our viewers, thank you for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed today's discussion as much as I have. I'd like to thank my colleagues at the Society who helped prepare for this program, Tom and Stephen for your guidance, Peter for your production skills, Claire for the promotional boost, and our wonderful intern, Unji, for all your logistical support being the person behind the scenes doing so much hard work. Uh, please check out our website at koreasociety.org to peruse all of our content, including programs on policy, art, culture, and education. Today's uh, program is gonna be followed by a special student uh, Q&A and discussion ses session with all of the speakers who have been kind enough to agree to participate. The students are coming from Columbia's uh, students in a Korea Focus Club at SEPA. They're all MA candidates there. And so I, I'd like to say, if you're interested uh, in your student club doing a discussion session following a Korea Society program, please get in touch at policy at koreasociety.org. We love to do extra and specialized engagement towards student groups. So thank you everyone for tuning in and I hope you have a great day.